Welcome to Plant Your Seed. I'm your host, Fred Ferris. On each episode, we share stories of how ordinary people have transformed their lives. Each story is compassionate, each story is authentic, and each story is a transformation. Here are the stories of the people who are changing our world by transitioning to a plant-based diet. Today on Plant Your Seed, we have Kimberly Barnes. Kimberly is a self-taught private chef, the founder of Might Be Vegan, and the creator of the award-winning national COVID-19 hunger relief program, Food Love. Welcome, Kimberly. Thank you so much for having me, Fred. Thanks for being on Plant Your Seed. Now, before we get into Food Love, let's start with when and why you transitioned to a plant-based diet. Yes, of course. So the win is a little hazy because I transitioned gradually. I started off not cooking meat at home, and then I went from not cooking meat at home to not eating meat out um, to then giving up dairy and cheese and all of that. So I have no, I don't have like a, an anniversary. I don't have, what do we call them? Vegan vegan anniversary or something? I don't, right? I don't have that. I don't have one. <laughs> Um, it's somewhere maybe four ish years ago, I believe. Um, but, but again, my transition was gradual. Uh, the reason it it started off for health reasons. So I've always had veganism in my mind thinking that that may be the epitome of, of eating healthy, you know, and, and that's kind of what I thought assumed, um, because I think everybody has a little bit of knowledge, regardless if they understand exactly what veganism is. Everybody knows that eating more plants, eating more fruits and vegetables is good for your body, like period. Like there's nobody can test that in general, not nobody who has a, a, a head on their shoulders and a brain inside. Um, but I think what it became was a lot more than that. It became my understanding of how animal agriculture is impacting our planet, what it means for the people who live near these these uh, factory farms, um, what our world looks like in the way of um, food insecurity and how much better we would be off health-wise by um, feeding people healthy food as opposed to the junk that that's on the shelves and in these fast food places. And then also then kind of the latter part of it for me was, wait a minute, these animals are not just animals. They don't belong to us. They're not ours. We don't just kill them because we can, you know, like this, they're, they're beings and, and we're sharing this space together and what we're doing is wrong, you know? So it it was a a combination of all of those things. And, um, that's the very, very brief story of of how I became a plant-based eater. Okay. So you said that it was for health reasons. Yes. We began that way. Yes. What part of your health was at issue that you decided that you were going to go plant-based? Yeah, so I didn't have any issues, actually. My my health has been and has always been pretty tip-top. Like there, I don't, I've never had like high cholesterol, hypertension, diabetes. I never had all any of that, but my family did. <laughs> oh. And so when I as a youngster was watching how their bodies were changing, you know, we're going to the hospital because, you know, such and such person had a stroke, such and such had a, had a heart attack. Now this person can't walk. Now they're stuck in a hospital bed. Now I'm watching all of this unfold and I'm like, how the heck did this happen? And how do I make sure that that's not me in 20, 30 years? So I didn't want to be that person who was living off of the pharmaceutical industry. I didn't want to have to pay to stay alive in through, through medication. I would rather pay to keep myself healthy than pay to keep myself alive, if that makes sense. Um, so I knew very early that I wanted to move away from the fatty meats and go into lean meats. So I, I focused primarily on eating lean meats in my teenage years and, and into my um, early twenties. And then after that, it became, um, how do we incorporate more vegetables? How do we add some diversity of color to what's on my plate? And then I knew eventually at some point I would give up at least the majority of the meat that I was eating. Um, but it it wasn't until um, maybe four years ago that it was that kind of hard stop where it's like, okay, no, something's got to change. Um, but no, I've never had any any health issues, but everyone around me has. Like my my cousin who is t- three years older than me, You know, we grew up in the same environment, different households, obviously, but in the same environment, eating very similar things. And um, she had an episode with her heart. And I'm like, 
this, that's me. You're me. We're the, we're the same. Right. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want that to be me. Like, what do I need to do? So that's not me. Um, so, so yeah, so that's kind of, you know, how it, how it turned out. Now, did you see any positive changes either mentally or physically since you changed over to a plant-based diet? Definitely, definitely right at the very beginning when I started to eat more plants, I noticed a lot more mental clarity. And I already thought that I was pretty mentally clear because I'm a, I'm a pretty bright person. At least I think so. <laughs> um, so, so to have more clarity, I think is, was, was, was cool. Um, I also was sleeping better. Um, going to the bathroom, like this is huge. Going to the bathroom was like easy now, mm -hmm. you know? Um, one thing that a lot of people don't know about me is that when I was younger, I had a lot of allergies. I was allergic to almost everything. I couldn't eat much when it come, when it comes to meats that I could eat, I was allergic to chicken. I didn't like fish. So the only things that I could eat were pork and beef. And if you know anything about beef, then you know, it's, it stays in your system for quite some time. And it doesn't, when it's, when it's on its way out, like it's, it's not fun. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there would be days where I would go without going to the bathroom during really? number two, like maybe four days. Wow. And I thought that was normal. I thought it was normal for me to like only go to the bathroom, like maybe three times, two to three times a week. Huh. Now I go to the bathroom basically however many times I eat, you know, within about, you know, 30 minutes to an hour. So now it's like three, four times a day. And I'm like, that's what it should be like. <laughs> right. <laughs> like we should not be sitting around with poop inside our bodies for three, four days at a time. Like what in the world? So I, I thought that was normal, but clearly it, it was not. Um, so that, that has been a huge change and I'm excited about that change because I, I think that that means that I have a, a healthier gut, um, and a, a healthier digestive tract in that way. Um, as far as, you know, getting physicals and that kind of thing, like my numbers are always great. Um, I used to have, uh, I had low iron for a few times, um, mm -hmm. just in my life, even when I ate meat, I had low iron a few times. And so I try to be mindful of consuming things that, that ensure that I'm getting some balance there. And I, th I think that again, is with anybody who's thinking about going plant-based, you have to be mindful to get a a myriad of nutrients and a myriad of types of food so that you can get lots and lots of different types of nutrients. Um, it doesn't change just because you go plant-based. I had low iron and I was eating a lot of meat, you know, so it's not about, um, the meat that you're consuming. It's about being cognizant of, of what you're taking in overall, um, to make sure that you get balance in your nutrition. Um, so, you know, now I'm thinking about it more, which I think is a, a positive change because I'm thinking about, um, the nutrients that I might be missing based on what I ate that week, which is a little, which is very different than what it used to be. It used to be just like, okay, let's have some meat and some veggies and we're good to go. Right. Um, now I'm thinking about all of the things that, that, that my body needs. Now, what other allergies did you have and have those gone away? Oh Lord. Oh, allergies. Okay. I was allergic to bananas, peaches, tomatoes, so that meant I, like pizza, I couldn't do anything with ketchup, anything with like tomato sauces. I couldn't eat that. Um, Can you eat that now? Oh yeah, I've so I stopped having allergies. Uh, it's been maybe ten years, fifteen years at least. Um, mm -hmm. So, but I did develop a new allergy, or an allergy that I identified that I didn't realize I had. So all of my allergies are gone except for one. So any combination of like soy and gluten together. My body hates it. I don't know what what the issue is and why it doesn't like that combination, but it's one of the reasons that I don't eat a lot of like faux meats and that kind of thing because it's usually soy and gluten together. Mm -hmm. My body is hates it. Like and it and the allergic reaction is painful. So we don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I stick to whole foods as much as possible. I know it's already better for my body. You know, no shade or shame to anybody who eats um faux meats and, and meat alternatives. It is not for me. My body says no. And so I, I don't consume that. Um, but I was allergic to like turnip greens and turnips. I mean, anything that you would list as like your top, like six, 10 to 10 foods, I probably couldn't eat eight of them. Like that list really? was long. Like I had to travel with a list of like, don't feed her these things. Um, uh, because it was just, it was so lengthy. And what age did you basically kind of stop 
being allergic to things. <laughs> Fred, you keep asking me dates. I don't remember dates. I will okay, say that about were you in least... high school? Were you in grade school? Were you in college? Um, I would say about, I would say about 15 years ago. So I don't know. How old was I then? Now I have to do math. If you didn't tell me this was a math podcast. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know it was going to be math. I, I, I don't want <laughs> to do it anymore. <laughs> I didn't study. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. So you were younger. <laughs> That's what we'll yes. say. <laughs> All right. Did you struggle with anything when you became plant-based? Granted, it was like four years ago and, you know, you were slowly transitioning. Was there anything that you struggled with as far as eating? Well, my transition was gradual. I gave up the things as they, as it felt good to me. Um, I tried not to pay attention to what everybody was trying to tell me to do and, and all of the, um, the anger that you sometimes see in the plant-based community that, that is called passion. Um, I took my time to do what I knew was sustainable for me because it's important that when I, when I got started moving towards being plant-based, that it's something that I can consistently do every day. Like, Otherwise, I'm just going to stop because I'd done that before. I had gone vegan for a week. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't, I mean, I had some okay dishes. There were a few things that I Googled on the internet. I didn't, they were all right, but I gave it up after a week because mm-hmm. I didn't have a plan. I, I wasn't ready for that. So, well, I did actually have, I did have chocolate avocado pudding for the first time, which was interesting. I was like, okay, that's, that's not bad. Um, but other than that, I don't remember anything really being like super tasty. Right. So this time I said, okay, well, let me, let me do a little bit more research on the front end. Let me understand what I need to survive in this way. And so I started to take my time, find recipes, um, find people who could inspire me, um, and please don't ask me what their names are. If you haven't figured out by now, <laughs> my my memory is not that great. So it's one of the reasons that I am I am a, a very much a, a truth teller because if I tell you one time and then I repeat it, it's because I forgot. But you know it was the truth <laughs> because I didn't remember what I said. Um, so because <laughs> I couldn't be a good liar because I'm like, oh wait, did I say that? <laughs> my bad. That wasn't the truth. Um, so so fast forward. Um, I. I took my time. I started off with finding, again, finding some people who inspired me, finding recipes that I thought were interesting, taking the things that I already love and then removing the meat from them, but still figuring out how to, um, enjoy the flavor. Honestly, being a, um, somebody who has already had a strong passion for the food space. I took this as a challenge. Like how can I, what can I bring to the space as far as in the way of food? And, um, how do I challenge myself to, still have the flavors and the mouth feels that I love, but do that with vegetables. And so it, it really just became an adventure. It's one of the reasons why I call myself, um, a kitchen adventurer in my, um, in my emails, because that's what food is for me. It's an adventure, an adventure to understanding and finding new foods, to experiencing with the combination of new flavors and, and all of that. You're a self-taught private chef. And I would just think that chefs in general would love that challenge to create new things, wouldn't you? Yeah, I, I would. But you have to remember that I have been cooking a certain way for a really long time. So imagine someone saying, hey, this is how you've been doing whatever. Now change all of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like, oh, wow. Okay. So everything just, I can't do anything the same. So, so we don't have butter anymore. Okay. And we don't have cream anymore. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I'm from the South. Butter, cream, <laughs> uh, uh, bacon fat, Greek. Like that's, this is, this is how we get umame. Like, what are you talking uh-huh. about? <laughs> so now I have to redo everything. Like it's, it's, it's exciting, but also daunting at the same time because I'm changing everything that I'm doing and I'm having to rethink everything. And I didn't go to culinary school. I just really love food and have been experimenting for a long time to the point where all of my friends want me to open a restaurant. So Yes, it's an adventure, um, but it's also a lot of work, you know, because I still have to feed myself at the end of the day. Like, I don't want every time that I go into the kitchen that I'm working, you know, sometimes I just want to be like, okay, let's figure it out. Let's throw it together. And I know what I'm doing and we're eating, you know, because nobody likes the hangry me. 
No. I don't even like the hangry <laughs> meat, you know? So we just want to, we want to get there as quickly as possible. But, um, thankfully I still love being in the kitchen, you know? So, um, I learned a lot and now we're on the other side of it. Now you mentioned the anger slash passion of the vegan kind of plant-based community. Why do you think that is? I think with any belief system, no matter what it is, people have the tendency to take on the beliefs of that system in a way that they believe that they are all right. And they believe that anybody who believes anything else is all wrong. And we create these segments of people who are not like us. And those are the bad people. And there's so many examples of that in history. And a lot of that has a lot, a lot of times it has like negative outcomes. So I'll give an example. Um, Nazi Germany. We are the right people. These Jews and these gays, they are the bad people. And so we need to separate ourselves from them. It's in our human nature to connect with people who are the same as us. We see that when we are in high school. You, if you remember being in high school, you probably sat at the, the, the dining room table with people who were like you. You sat at the table with the jocks, if you were a jock. You sat with the nerds, you sat with the goths, you sat with the black kids, you sat with the Asian kids. Because there is safety, in many cases, in sameness. However, also with sameness, can come ego and the belief that those who are unlike you don't have a place and they need to be come you and like you in order for them to be right. I think that there's a lot of room for growth in many of those places. Now, please don't quote me to say that I'm thinking that that Nazis are are cool. Like, don't. That's not what I'm saying. (laughs) No, <laughs> that's a whole different kind of thing. What I'm saying is, is when we're talking about even in like religious beliefs, we we separate ourselves and say and elevate ourselves like, oh, we are the chosen group. We are this. We are that. Um, maybe or maybe not, you know, and I think it's probably a lot of the maybe not um, because all of us deserve a space. All of us deserve um, to be accepted, to be included. Doesn't mean that we all don't have ways that we can grow. That's not what that is. Um, but that passion, um, and that anger can come from a space of people wanting their values and, and to express their values as the values. I am the epitome of this and anything, anybody who says anything, otherwise they're wrong. Now, sometimes there is a bit of, um, don't you understand that you're harming someone? Like, why can't you see this and stop? And that passion can come, can begin, you know, just with passion. But over time, after you've shared your belief with people and they keep ignoring you, you, you build up a little bit of hubris, you know, you build up a little bit of, of, of a wall Mm -hmm. that then when you're expressing it, you're expressing not just your passion, but the fact that there were 172 people in the last six months who gave you flag. And so that next person is getting all of that anger now, not just that passion. So it's a it's an important moment to consider how your passion is being received by others. And some people will say, well, they you know, they're harming people. So, you know, it doesn't matter how they feel about it. OK, if that works for you, keep going. Doesn't work for everybody. I don't function well by being bullied. Mm -hmm. nobody bullies me into doing anything. You're actually going to get the opposite. You're going to get an eye roll. You're going to get a get out of my face, even if you're right, because of how you came Uh to me. You know, I'll hear you. Like I hear everybody. Like when people say things, I listen, but bullying me doesn't make me change. It makes me just not like you. And so if everybody in that space is doing that, if everybody in a, like hypothetically a Christian space is beating people over the head with the Bible and everybody in the vegan space is beating people over the head with, with videos of, of animals being tortured and telling them how evil they are for eating chicken. It's like, this is a complete mind change. 
And sometimes people need time to do that. I needed time. Right. But I'm still here. You know, so I think we have to give people information and grace and allow the rest to happen. Um, it's a, it's about being a support system sometimes. Um, because not everybody is a cold turkey kind of person. I'm not a cold turkey. Um, I was a gradual. And then at that point it was like, okay, now I'm cold turkey. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, now we're not going back, but it took me a while to get there. So I can appreciate spaces that allow for people to get started and to try without judgment. Yeah. I think that that's, that's one of the big things that I, I find is that people are on their own separate journeys and you can't force somebody to do something. So you might want to be there to understand what they're going through and support them in order for them to change. For sure. For sure. Absolutely. And I think, um, I think it's exactly what you said, Fred. I think it's about support. I think that's what everybody around every issue that we're, we're seeing elevated right now, they're looking for is how can you support them? I agree. As far as your passion for food love, can you give me an overview or our listeners an overview of exactly what food love is? Yes, 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 yes. So food love is a national hunger relief program that I started last year from my bedroom. Um, it is a fully virtual um, location independent program that can feed anybody anywhere that has a mailbox um, in the lower 48 states. It is the only program of its kind. Um, I'm the only black woman to to create a national hunger relief effort, and it's the only effort that is 100% plant-based. So how we do what we do is we partner people in need through our advocate network with brands that are preparing food, and then they then deliver that food directly to those families. So technically, Food Love is a technology solution to a logistics problem. We recognize that a lot of times people don't have access to food, um, access to certain um, things that will keep them healthy, um, especially we've seen that elevate during COVID-19 pandemic. And we address that through the technology that upholds Food Love. Basically, you've partnered with a company that delivers the food to people in need. Yes, correct. Multiple partners, multiple families, yes. Okay, how do you decide who gets the food? I don't decide, actually. Um, or how do they we, decide? <laughs> so we have an advocate network. The Advocate Network is made up of a um, people within the community that recognize the need. They are licensed professionals who work in this space regularly. Um, this is what they do. That's their job. So they bring us referrals, and that's how we know who to feed. Wow, that's fantastic. Such a great program and, and something that is so needed. What did you see that made you feel that this was a necessary thing? For sure. So it was, I think, April um, of 2020, and I was watching the news and I was seeing how farmers were remulching the food that they were planning to harvest and sell back into the ground. Right. Um, I also saw the news about how BIPOC, the BIPOC populations, or specifically Black people and Latinx in this context, were dying at twice the rate of their white counterparts after contracting COVID-19. And then those numbers were even worse after hospitalization. So two things popped up for me. One, I was like, so you mean to tell me that there's food out there and these people are standing in line around the block you know, multiple times at food banks. And then there are farmers over here that are just throwing, that are like mulching food. Like, why is that? Why are we not? Why is there no connection here? Right. Like people in need, you, you're you throwing stuff away and they're trying to, what? So that to me said, okay, somebody hasn't thought about this problem in a way that gives us the infrastructure to help in these moments. Because if at any point a farmer says, you know what, we've got so much food, we can't sell it. We've got to now turn it into fertilizer. Yo, I, I didn't understand. I didn't understand. I was like, okay. So I honestly, 
before we moved into the way that, that the food love program looks now, I started to um, reach out to farmers first. I realized that that's a whole different kind of group of people that they're not ready for me. <laughs> 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 and I was like, Oh, I mean, yeah, it was, it was interesting. Um, I can't explain to you the community of farmers unless you've actually met farmers because in many cases, their connection or our connection to technology is like centuries behind, it feels like. And their desire to really do anything other than how they've been doing it is like, you're not going to be some, you know, young whippersnapper and come in here and tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. Like, and it wasn't a matter of me telling them what to do. It was just asking, like, how could we, you know, yada, yada. And they were nice. Don't get me wrong. I've talked to a few of them. They were nice. Um, but they have a way about what they do and they've been doing it and it works for them. So I realized that that was not going to work. Um, so I had to figure out another way to bridge some gaps. And so that's when, um, I had this, um, saw something either was on Instagram or the news. I don't know. Somebody was doing like online matchmaking, which we know exists, right? We know mm -hmm. that there's online matchmaking. There's apps for that. But what they were doing was actually connecting real people with real people through, um, they were manually doing the matches. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And shortly thereafter, I said, well, what if I could be a matchmaker? Like how could, maybe I can be a matchmaker, but in food. Mm. I'm like, what, what if I could do that? So then I had to figure out how do I find the two people that need matching or the two groups that need matching. And it kind of just like spun off from there. I love this. I, I think it's such a needed thing and it's so great. I, I commend you on taking it and making it happen. You're working, you're, you're making a living and all of a sudden you just take time out of your life to just make this happen for tons of people. Where did you get the courage to just start this? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's important that listeners understand that food love is an outgrowth of who I am and what might be vegan is here to do. It's not something that's an anomaly. So just to give an example um, or some context rather. So I've been very much connected to food insecurity since I was seven, eight, nine years old. Um, before I was 11, um, I was a member, um, well, let me rephrase that. So before I turned 11, I reached out to the pastor at the church where I was attending and asked him if we could start a food bank. I was like 10 um, and he was about 60. And so imagine like what that looks like. This little 10 year old girl, probably with pigtails telling this older man who's running a church, we need to have a food bank. Can I, can I do it? <laughs> <laughs> and so I framed it as, can I do it for the teenagers? You know, cause that's my demographic right at that time or the, mm -hmm. the youth. And so he said, okay. And so I, I started a food bank. I actually started a, a store as well, a store that would sell like pastries to the people that were coming to church in the morning. And we would use that to kind of fund the youth programs that we would do. So initiating things is a part of my DNA and it has been since I was a kid. Um, so has food insecurity. Um, it's been, it's very common for me to, prior to doing something for myself, like on a holiday to go out and first help other people. Um, it's something that I did myself. It wasn't something that my family said, Oh, we're going to do this together. Like it was my tradition. My tradition for holidays was always let's go to a food bank, help some people who don't have, and then we can go home and, and prepare what we need for ourselves. Um, so in 2019, 2018, 2019, um, the program that we ran under Might Be Vegan was called Vegan at the Game. Might Be Vegan takes on one major project a year, runs that for the entire year. It gives us um, the ability to really just dig in and do something cool um, and then focus our time and resources on doing that one thing. 
Mm-hmm. And so 2019, it was a Super Bowl. Super Bowl was coming to Atlanta, which is where I was at the time. And on a whim, somebody reached out to me and said, hey, so I potentially have some space that's like downtown right near the stadium. Would you be interested in like maybe selling some food, like doing a little pop up? I'm like, oh, that's interesting. OK. So then yeah. we started planning it. We started figuring it out. And then we have basically had the largest vegan tailgate in history unofficially at the Super Bowl. So we gave away food to everybody. And we did that through brand partnerships. So when you look at Food Love, Food Love is really just a reiteration of exactly what we've been doing. It's introducing people to plant-based foods, is giving it to them for free. But the difference in this moment is, unlike with the Super Bowl event, um, they were coming because of an activity. Now it's because of a need. So ultimately we're, we're doing the same thing. It's about driving people to live a healthier life and doing that in partnership with brands. And so that's what Might Be Vegan is about. It's a plant-based culinary group, um, media and marketing consultancy rather. And what we do is we create content with brands in order to ultimately help people live a more healthy life. And so you can see that through the stuff that we do. Um, and now we're actually have a philanthropic slant to this particular program. Um, and so food love is still the, the dedicated program for even 2021. That hasn't changed. Um, unless something new pops up, you know, in a couple of months in it and we shift, but, but right now that's the focus. Now, what is one thing that's exciting you these days in your life right now? I think I'm excited about the next phase of food love because we're looking at a few things. We're looking at how can we potentially use technology in the way that we have for food love to create spaces of food sovereignty for other people. And that meaning people have perpetual access to exactly what they need. Because a lot of what food love does is helping to bridge the gap where there isn't access. Um, and we want to do that like on a permanent basis because it's one thing to like give people a handout now, some support now, but what happens like in a month from now, if they're still in need, right? We mm-hmm. haven't really solved anything. We just fed them today. I want to be able to figure out how we can feed people forever. Right. You know? And I'm just like crazy enough to like take on that task. <laughs> I love like, that I, about you. Let's just, just like, let's just do it. I mean, because at the end of the day, like if we, if we miss the mark, getting close is amazing, you know? And I think getting close at least allows us to, um, to think about things differently in a way that we haven't before. It, much, many, many more of us had access years ago before the entrance of supermarkets. You know, so many of us had our own food right. in our backyards or in our neighborhoods or in our communities. But now it's all, we all kind of flock to a supermarket. But what if you're not near that? Or what if you don't have the money to go? Like so many, we've been talking about in the, um, you know, in the, the Twitter sphere and, and on Instagram and, you know, in the news and that kind of thing, we talk about a living wage versus minimum wage. Minimum wage, if you have, especially, I mean, even if you don't have kids, minimum wage is, is nothing. Right. Like you have to work so many hours just to be able to, to live a, a, an okay life. Um, you know, five, six, seven jobs, and then you never have any time for anything else other than working. Like nobody should have to live that way. That's not fair. So sometimes people don't have the money, even if they have access to the supermarket. And then we talk junk about folks and we say, oh, well, you know, you're on government assistance. Well, I hope this last year has made everybody think about that differently because so many of us have taken on government assistance. Shoot, that stimulus check is government assistance, if we're honest, you know. So I think figuring out how we can get back to some of the original ways is honestly what I'm thinking about. How can we get back to, and do it at scale? Because there's so many individuals like me who are working in their own communities. You know, I work in, hypothetically, I work in Brooklyn or, you know, I work in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I created a, um, you know, community garden and I work in, you know, Apex, North Carolina, or I work in Boulder, Colorado, whatever the thing is, right? Right. How can we do this at scale? How can we say we're working now in the entire state, the entire East Coast? How can we do that? That's what I want to that's what I want to tackle. And, you know, we'll see what happens. I I really thought that you were going to say 
one thing that was really exciting you right now is your weekend karaoke singing. <laughs> there I, is no karaoke right now. <laughs> I, I saw that on your website. I thought it was funny. <laughs> I mean, you know, it happens in my kitchen now. Like it's, it's what I do when I wash dishes because it's the only thing that will motivate me to wash dishes because I hate washing them. So I'll like have a full on dance party and karaoke set. Um, for for dishwashing only, um, but that's that's the, that's the only time that I actually pull it out. My neighbors get a full on concert. The last time, the last concert was it's probably like two a.m. I'm like, I hope you guys are okay because I am. <laughs> <laughs> who's your Who's your favorite uh, singer for you to karaoke to? Ooh, so usually my go to song. I, I usually grab gravitate to Erica Baidu. Uh-huh. Um, anybody who's like a, who's an alto and has like a lower register, um, I, I'm, I'm an alto. So I, I kind of lean to that. So like a Jill Scott or someone like that, like some like nineties jams, that kind of thing. Right. Um, but like my favorite is definitely Tyrone from Erica Badu. <laughs> I can, I can imagine you singing that at 2 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Now, what is one hack or habit that uh, helps you kind of stay on track with your plant-based diet? A habit? Oh, I wish I had habits. My habits are ordering food out that's too expensive from DoorDash. That's my habit. That's not a very good one. (laughs) It's not. It's not a good habit. Um, I wish I could tell people who are listening that I am an incredible meal planner and prepper. I am not. Um... I am really bad at sometimes going hours without eating um, because I'm focused on work. And I'm like, wait, did I eat today? I didn't. This is not good. I should eat. Um, I don't have good habits. And I'm just going to be honest about that. Um, I think recognizing, however, that I don't have good habits is one of the things that has motivated some changes in how I run the business. Um, So recently we brought in an assistant who for the last several years, weeks has been taking on some additional tasks that give me more freedom to do things that I need to do for my own sanity, basically. Um, so honestly, that that's really what it is. I'm, I don't have good balance. Um, I know sometimes people talk about, well, you need to have work-life balance. I do have work-life balance. I just don't have work-food balance because those are not the same for me. Like I'm healthy mentally. Um, I am not super stressed. I get a lot of work done. But sometimes I forget that I need to eat food. Um, yeah, it, it's a bad thing, but I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> just need somebody to come in and cook for you. And then when you're I know. hungry, you just they hand you the food. I know. So, I mean, we just need to get to the point where there's enough disposable income that somebody else can do meal prep for me. There you go. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great goal. I want that too. <laughs> right. <laughs> Now, what cookbook or book have you gifted most to somebody transitioning to a plant-based diet? Honestly, my own. I have like a mini cookbook. um, And we gift that mini cookbook to all of our families that are in our food love program. So it has about maybe seven to ten recipes in it. No, nine. It has nine. It has nine recipes in it. And they're super cheap things that you can make um, with stuff that you can get really cheaply at a grocery store. Um, so I give that to people and that comes as a part of the, um, transition program or transition guide that, um, used to be available on my website. I'm actually making changes to it, changes to it now. Um, but, but that is something that I, that I gift most often. Now, finally, can you give me one word to describe how you felt before you became vegan and one word to describe now that you are vegan? I have, it's, they're the same word, but I need an adjective, Fred. I need an adjective in front of them. Can I have like a word and a half? Uh, okay. Okay. Um, after is bliss, before is bliss, but it's ignorantly bliss. Because the thing is, I didn't know all of the things that I didn't know. I didn't know how much harm my diet was having. I didn't know how much it was, how much harm it was having on my body. And I was happy, but not the good kind of happy. So hopefully that, that, that meets your standard. That's great. 
Yeah, I don't think that we just don't understand, and I just mean people in general, what kind of harm is happening for us to get our food. Yeah, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. <laughs> Even our plant-based foods creates harm. And I think that sometimes people forget that. Like everything that you consume in agriculture, especially fruits and vegetables, it still is causing harm, period. No, the plants don't feel it. We're not talking about the plants. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're talking about the people who are exploited in the supply chain. And that is a huge conversation for another time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It's such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Now, what's the best way for people to find you on the web or social media? Yes. Yeah, so I am primarily on Instagram. You can connect with me at it's Kimberly Renee there. You can also find me on Patreon. We've just released a new um, podcast series trying to be like Fred when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> if you need any help, I'm right here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to have to get some new equipment so I can, my audio can sound as good as yours. Um, but we're working on just storytelling. Um, a lot of the, we've talked quite a bit today about the work that I do um, in the plant-based space and helping others. Um, but there's also the work around anti-oppression, anti-racism, and Patreon is dedicated specifically to that. Um, it's also important that you all remember this phrase, Thieving Thursdays, because every Thursday um, in the past month, what we've done has been highlighting brands that are behaving badly um, in their business and what we can do about it. And, and actually not just calling them out, but talking to them about making change. Um, because if you haven't figured out by now, um, change is important to me. And I'm not just a a talker, but rather a doer. So Instagram at it's Kimberly Renee, Patreon at it's Kimberly Renee. Um, and my website is mightbevegan.co. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Hope you are inspired by this story. And remember, it's never too late to plant your seed. Links to everything we talked about on the podcast can be found on Instagram at plant.yourseed in the show notes tab in the bio. If you enjoyed the show, remember to leave us a review. And until next time, thank you for listening.